Yep, you're good. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Okay, so um, I just want to be clear. I'm presenting this on behalf of the person who's been leading the MAP effort, which I'll describe in a moment, Mallory Kinchik. Uh, Mallory is having a baby this week, so I'm uh, giving this on her behalf. Um, but uh, she's been leading the bulk of this work. So anything that I don't know, I'll just uh, make it up. Um, but it's not her fault for not telling me, it's my fault for not asking her. Uh, so as you know, Mallory is doing her PhD with me at NC State. Uh, go pack. And uh, uh, we've been funding this project for about three years at this point. Uh, we're not quite there yet, but we're, we're getting there. Um, our goal is to produce the first global geological map of Mercury. So can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, so I don't think I need to convince anybody on this uh, at the workshop the value of a, of a geological map or a global geological map, but I want to particularly explain why we're doing a global one for Mercury. And the reason is because you may know that Mercury was visited by NASA's messenger spacecraft from 2011 through 2015. And indeed, there were three flybys before then uh, in which uh, messenger returned images of the, essentially the entire surface. But in the 70s, the Marin 10 spacecraft imaged about 45% of the surface. And those 45%, uh, uh, the quads corresponding to that part of the planet, were basically drawn up as geological maps. And in this graphic here, you can see on the right-hand side, there's a bunch of these quads that have some or all of their interior filled in by this stuff. Uh, and the point being that uh, there was a, a long-standing issue in the generation of these quads because often people making them didn't communicate with each other. And I don't need to tell folks listening here that that can be a big problem when you try and stitch everything together and synthesize it. And I see Dave Rothery is commenting here. This map is not, a, this list is not necessarily exhaustive. My goal isn't here to give you an update on all the individual quads that, that folks, particularly in Europe, are working on. Dave will be able to do that. But the goal is to show you that there are legacy quads from Mariner 10 and existing quads under construction or, or published uh, from messenger data. Data, but there is no global framework into which we put these quads, uh, which means we will have to be developed to stitch all these things together. The goal of the global map is not to replace this, it's to provide a foundation, a framework into which those quads can be put. Uh, naturally, those quads will have more detail and have more unit breakdowns than we have, but at least we're trying to kind of standardize things over the entire surface. So it's providing a broader context for those quad maps, a basis for understanding units that, tr that, that extend beyond one particular quadrangle, and basically helping establish the global stratigraphy of Mercury. The, the, the global time stratigraphic series we have for Mercury right now was developed from Mariner 10. Uh, it's not necessarily clear that we need a new one, but it's important to know that when that sequence was developed, we didn't see half of the surface of Mercury. Uh, we didn't know about the Rembrandt Basin, for example, the second largest preserved impact basin on Mercury. So getting this global context is really going to help. OK, so uh, let's go to the next slide, please. The current status of this map. Uh, those of you who've been here the last few years have seen that, uh, yep, thank you. Uh, you've seen a version of this already. The, the global map status hasn't changed very much from last year insofar as how it looks. Um, we basically have the major map units in place. We have descriptions for them. We have the correlation of map units essentially done. The description of map units is done. Most of the stuff is done. I'll, I'll turn in a moment to tell you what's left. There's one particular aspect of this, though, that we are tackling, and it's the focus of what we work we've been doing lately that Mallory has been leading with uh, Brett Denevi and, and Deborah Wojcicki. I know Deborah's on the call, um, which is to try and identify, if we can, and if so, where, identify subunits of the intercrater planes. The intercrater planes are the dominant physiographic unit on Mercury. They are the kind of duck egg blue color you see underneath everything else in this global map. You see the rectangular projection at mid to low latitudes and then the two poles, north and south, left and right respectively. The intercrater planes are what you get left over in your GIS project once you take everything else out. And that's usually how it's been mapped. And it's extremely difficult to identify any subunits in there, partly because it's extremely old terrain. It's somewhere between about 3.7, 3.6, and 4.1 billion years old. It's wrecked geologically, and it is really hard to systematically identify subunits. And we think from work we've been doing uh, in parallel with this, uh, a lot of people have been doing, the intercrater planes probably represent in the bulk voluminous flood basalts that course over the ground and fill each other in, which means their emplacement histories isn't straightforward, nor is it necessarily uniquely preserved. However, there is value, if we go to the next slide, to talk about what's happening in the intercrater planes. And I'm just going to spend 30 seconds to say that with the enhanced color maps and with supervised classifications of those maps, that uh, Mallory, Deborah, and Brett have been working to try and identify specific targeted places in the integrated planes. Not all the integrated planes been together, but specific places where we might be able to systematically identify subunits on the basis of things like color. 
That work is ongoing, we're not finished yet, but the goal is to wrap that up relatively soon so we can actually say something about the geology of integrated planes and not have it as one massive unit. So that's one of the, the, the big outstanding science related tasks we're doing for this task. Okay, if you go to the last slide, the anticipated timeline, just to give you a sense, we have almost everything in place. Uh, we need to update the line work of tectonic features, finalize those subunits of the integrated planes, uh, complete the COMU and DOMU, which will reflect what we find for the integrated planes mapping, and then finish drafting the map, map pamphlet, most of which is already in hand. Our hope is to submit this for review later this year, revise early 21, and then by spring 21 publish it. Um, but bearing in mind that we have, uh, Mallory uh, now has you know, a new baby, uh, COVID is slowing down her progress, it's certainly slowing down my progress because of the teaching in the fall. So we don't know the impact of COVID on this timeline, but the notional aspirational timeline is to say, we'll have this published by the middle of next year. And that's it, thank you.